moment to think back to your freshman year of high school. A year filled with hope, determination, and more ambition than you knew what to do with. The athletes coming in ready for varsity practice. The theater kids ready to sell out the entire high school auditorium. And the overly ambitious science kids ready to take on real science. Ready for insane explosions and making concoctions out of chemicals we probably couldn't even pronounce. So the first day of our science research class, we came in ready for something really good, only to have our mentor hand us all articles on plants, and not something cool and exotic, or something normal that you would find in your high school lab. We were stuck working with this weird looking thing. It was no surprise when half the people in class with us that day never came back. Apparently, high school students weren't allowed to conduct experiments involving animals, humans, or harmful chemicals. Because, you know, that might be classified as fun. <laughs> Actually, working in a high school lab meant getting really creative with how you dealt with restrictions. When Zana, our friend Jasmine, and I finally accepted that we were stuck working with plants, we decided to do a little more research. So after skimming through about 500 articles with vocabulary we could hardly understand at the time, we came across something interesting. A lot of these articles talked about the harmful effect of pollutants on gene expression. So we decided to study the effects of pollution, especially air pollution, on plant development. Considering where we're from, we know what a huge global issue air pollution can be. We thought long and hard about how we could do this experimentally. So far, the only ways that Dr. Basundial, or as we like to call him, Dr. B, our mentor, had allowed us to study pollution was through reading scientific journals. One journal article in particular spoke about ozone, a major constituent of urban smog that had a bunch of health effects on plant development. There was no way, however, that our high school was going to purchase an ozone generator, because those things can be pretty expensive, about upwards of $300. Also, releasing a toxic gas into a high school setting wasn't really something our mentor was up for. We had to find a way that was cheap and safe to study ozone. So naturally, we Googled it, and we came across this little box with wires coming out of it on Amazon that apparently cleaned water using ozone. It was only $70. And then it dawned on us, that plant that our mentor had stuck us with grew in water. If we could bubble the ozone into the water that our plant was growing in, we could avoid spreading the gas throughout the classroom and purchase something relatively cheap. So at least we had one thing figured out and out of the way. Now we just need to figure out which part of the plant we need to study. Much like the human body, the body of a plant is extremely complex, so you tend not to study the whole thing. We noticed a study on NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, about a gene that was activated in response to ozone. This gene was present in major crops like rice, wheat, barley, and corn, Naturally, our thought was that this gene was doing something to protect the plants against an ozone, which is why it was activated. However, growing rice, wheat, or barley would be hard to do in our high school lab. We searched through the genome of our mentor's plant and found a copy of this gene. We then decided to use Ceratopteris as a tool to study our gene. Even though the existence of this gene was known, no one knew where it was or what it did. Although we didn't really have the budget to study the gene using common lab techniques, as this would require big or expensive equipment, we found ways to get creative studying the gene we had found. Our mentor had taught us about a gene silencing technique that could basically be used to inactivate the gene we were targeting. It wasn't too expensive, and anything that we needed could easily be bought online. This technique would allow us to compare Ceratopteris' responses to ozone with or without the gene to see if the gene was really protecting the plants. As expected, the plants with inactivated genes suffered a lot more damage than those with the active gene. But we didn't stop there. Although we couldn't see where in the cell the gene was, we ran its sequence through a series of online programs that told us it was likely located in the membrane of the mitochondria or the chloroplast. Through roundabout ways like these, we were actually able to learn a lot about the gene, including the fact that it potentially had a role in protection against not just ozone, but also salt in the soil, drought, and pathogen attack. We were pretty excited at this point because we realized if we could put our gene in other plants, we could potentially help protect them against any of these environmental stresses. Not many people, however, had the same reaction. In fact, I shared our research at one of my family gatherings and was met with a lot of condescending surprise that all of our research had been done in a high school lab. For them, anything lacking the brand name of a university lacked significance. But this didn't stop us. In fact, it did just the opposite. It motivated us to prove them wrong. So what if we were still classified as children? 
So what if we didn't have the same resources as others? What many people forget about success is that it's not easy. Sometimes the brightest ideas are faced with the most negativity. So fast forward to the morning of October 18th, 2013. The three of us sat anxiously waiting in an informational college session, refreshing our phones every five seconds. In the spring, we had submit to the Siemens competition in math, science, and technology, a research competition to which over 1,500 group projects were submit annually. The day was finally here. The regional finalists for Siemens were to be announced any minute now. I reloaded my phone and scrolled down until I finally landed on our names. With a shocked look, I turned to Zanub and mouthed, finalist. I wasn't really a good lip reader, so I just stared at her face with a confused expression until she held up her phone again, pointing to the screen and mouthing the words again. The moment that informational session ended, we ran out of the room straight to our mentor, called our parents, and immediately began intensely stalking every one of the people we were up against and their research. <laughs> Not gonna lie, we were pretty intimidated by our opposition. These students were from specialized high schools, had publications, and had done their research at top universities, places like MIT, Columbia, Cornell. But Dr. B didn't seem worried. He said he would work with us nonstop until we knew every aspect of our project. For him, if we knew our stuff, we would be unbeatable. Although we didn't exactly share his unwavering confidence and faith in our abilities, we decided to give it our best shot and see what happened. We soon found out that nonstop was an understatement. That classroom became a second home. We were there during school, after school, when school was canceled, on weekends, and on holidays. It got to the point where Dr. B would come in on Saturday mornings with Dunkin' Donuts just to wake us up before he grilled us on every aspect of our research. In fact, working with him was so insanely nerve-wracking that when we did finally get to regionals, the judge's questioning wasn't half as bad as Dr. B's scrutiny. <laughs> Luckily, his intensity paid off because with all of his drilling, we went on to win. <laughs> Winning the competition, knowing that we had made the best use of our resources, was a really rewarding feeling. And one of the best parts was that we made a lot of professional connections that we still keep in touch with. <laughs> However, we were met with a lot of negativity. Immediately after winning, we were put on the phone with local reporters. I distinctly remember one reporter asking, How does it feel to win the Siemens competition, being three girls and all? I was silent for a while. I didn't know whether to say excuse me or just stay quiet and hope he got the message. Online comments were just as ignorant. People would post online that they were outraged three immigrant girls were winning prizes they believed American children should be stepping up to receive. Um, I was born in Boston. <laughs> Attention from the media wasn't all bad, however. Our district had been for a long time ready to completely cut our science research program. Attention from the media made it more obvious the potential that could be achieved with a little resourcefulness and some knowledge. The fact that we won Siemens meant that we could help win over funding for future students that were going through science research at our school. Our situation went to show that no matter who you are or what resources you have, you can still make an impact. It doesn't matter what other people tell you, only you know what you're capable of and never let anyone tell you otherwise. On that note, quick shout out to our mentor, Dr. Terence Basundial, for always believing in us. And Jasmine, our third partner in crime, who's currently studying at Columbia. We miss, we miss you. you. And lastly, to the audience for taking the time to listen to the story behind our science. Thank you so much.